Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. One of the members had suggested that I address the topic of exit strategy, so I'm going to try to. I'm just going to try to touch upon it here because it's actually something that we're exploring ourselves right now. But to start out with, I want to look at the crypto market cap. Now you can see that we're 103 billion. I think we hit 113 total uh, crypto market cap. The biggest standout here is the fact that Ethereum is gaining on Bitcoin. Now I mentioned to Jennifer today, one of the potential strategies of the powers that be may be to take their cryptocurrency, which I think Ethereum probably is controlled by the powers that be. I, I really haven't investigated it that much simply because I know that Bitcoin isn't and the other ones I have doubts about. But the rumors are that it is. The rumors are probably correct. So is it a play that you can gamble with? Absolutely. Uh, but is it something that you want to keep money in? I don't think so. Now, what could the possible strategy be? Well, one strategy that they could pursue, we know that the powers that be have an infinite amount of dollars. They can print them. Uh, they don't even print them anymore. They just simply hit a button and they add uh, a zero to a line and they have more. It's that simple. So that means they can put the price of anything to anything, literally. The price of anything that you can buy with dollars, they can put it to any dollar price. Uh, high, obviously. Low is a little bit more difficult because it creates shortages, and we see that in the precious metals. But as far as as high as they want to put the price, they can put the price as high as they want. What if they put the price of the market cap of Ethereum to a trillion dollars, and Bitcoin continues to fall to, say, 10 billion? So let's say that the market cap of Ethereum is a thousand times that of Bitcoin, something like that, something crazy like that, uh, maybe a hundred times, hundred times, thousand times. Is it possible? Absolutely it's possible. What would, what would that result in? Well, it would probably result in Bitcoin becoming irrelevant, at least as far as people... Uh, transacting and talking and uh, what would that do well there's a couple of things they could do from there the first thing they could do is that they could crash it 99 percent they could crash it down let's say they could run it up to a trillion dollar market cap and then they could crash it down to say 10 billion say a third of where it is right now that would effectively wipe everyone out and it would also wipe out their confidence in cryptocurrencies, etc. It would do tremendous damage. The other thing that they could do is they could just keep it up that high and draw people's money in and then uh, inflate it away slowly over time, just as exactly as they've done with the uh, fiat currencies. So both of those are a possibility. Do I think it'll do I think that's going to happen? I don't think so. Um, I, I'm a little bit shocked to see Ethereum to begin to approach the market cap of Bitcoin. So I'm starting to suspect that. You have to remember that Ethereum now is $335. I believe that Ethereum was $2 just, uh, was it a year ago? back in July yeah a little over a year ago it's off this chart but uh, ethereum was two dollars here it is here's 90 let's see here 51 cents back in October of 2015 and now it's 333 dollars that's a 666 fold gain roughly uh, pretty amazing so is it possible? Is it, uh, is it likely? I don't think so. Is it possible? Yes. So let's get to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is still in that uh, dropping phase. Uh, basically what I did was when Bitcoin hit roughly, I believe it was 2200 recently. Um, I think it was 2200 a few days ago. It was right around in here. I went long. 100% long, you'll see in my Poloniex account, got out roughly around the 25, 26 area, I think. Went 100% uh, USDT, and now I'm beginning to scale in. 
Uh, now the big question is going to be, you know, where's the bottom? It, is this going to be a 90% correction? It could be. It could be one of the 90% corrections. We've had, uh, don't quote me on it, but based on my recollection, we've had three 90% corrections already in Bitcoin, where Bitcoin has lost 90% of its value. A 90% correction from here would take us to $300. It would take us below here. I think that's highly unlikely. I think that the biggest correction we're probably going to get is right to here at 1200 So let me show you my Poloniex account. And here we go. Uh, I, I've been busy going to the gym, biking, doing things, and uh, I haven't been trading. I should have been trading 24-7, but... Uh, it becomes a burnout and then also um, I don't like to go long for the most part I don't like to go long any of the alts when bitcoins in a bear market and I've explained that before because you have a potential of a double loss you have the alt potential of the altcoin going down but also Bitcoin going down at the same time so for that reason I've been primarily in USDT now I can show you here uh, what I'm doing with Bitcoin right now you can see I have open orders under the market so with Bitcoin, and this is in your USDT, it's a little bit different. You can see it's 2330, uh, 2339 up here on Bifinex, 2334 in USDT, pretty close. So you can see that I have bids under the market. We're at 2309, roughly. Uh, I have a buy for one Bitcoin at 2200, uh, a buy for two Bitcoins at 2000, four Bitcoins at 1800, four Bitcoins at 1600, 10 bitcoins at 1200 and 12 bitcoins at a thousand that's just in case that happens and that's not really unprecedented we had that 16 sixteen uh, hundred dollar price tick back in here i think it was actually 1500s uh no we're not far enough out right there 1540 we hit in usdt so it's not out of the realm of possibility so you can see basically how this strategy has worked so far. Uh, these are the ones that I had scaled in that got hit. This this 26.93 price was where I immediately took that and sold it on Coinbase. So that one doesn't count. Uh, this 10 that I sold here, this is the ones that I bought at 22 and sold at 10. Uh, sold 10 at 25.37 and then some others here. Scaled out of it. Uh, so this buy here up at 26.93, that was uh, a coin uh, that I sent over to Coinbase to sell, which I sold, you know, at nearly 3,000. But these these last three here are my scaling in. So you can see that the one that I had at 24.50 got hit, the one I had at 23.50 got hit, and the one I had at 2,300 got hit. And I have one remaining at 2,200, two at 2,000. Uh, so I don't know where the price is going to go. I know that it tends to bounce dramatically when it when it does make a bottom but I don't know where that's going to be it, it definitely looks like we're taking out this last one uh, does that set us up for a challenge of this one and ultimately a 1550 low it's possible so uh, I'm keeping my powder dry and uh, just scaling in uh, in a very tiny amount that's basically how I do that strategy um, right now the only two coins I'm long of our library credits have some of those and then I'm also playing for a bounce in pot coin which had a pretty big run up and then my buying was based upon this technical bounce right here I basically got in at 51 you can see that pot coin had a huge volume run and then corrected back and it it corrected just to where that old high was which uh, which is a very good technical entry point uh, based on the type of trading I like to do. It also is in the spot where I like it, which is challenging an old all-time high. I like to buy coins breaking into new all-time highs. So this one, even though it kind of broke my rule about buying in a downtrending Bitcoin market, this one in library credits kind of had uh, an exceptional chart pattern. And for that reason, I'm long a very small amount of those and scaling into a, a long position on those. But again it's a very small position so this is the overall Bitcoin chart uh, it looks pretty bearish to me it looks like we're at least gonna get a test of 2000 and we very could likely eat the first uh, the next one is gonna be this test right here at about 
1850 to 1880. And the next one's going to be this test at 1200. And then uh, after 1200, if we get through that, then we're talking about this support down here at 800. And then ultimately, I think the oldest top is going to be around 300 down. I just can't see us getting down there. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if this first one held uh, the most punishing crash, uh, roughly 1200 should hold. I've like I, I showed you, I've got big buys in for 1200 and a thousand, just in case we get down there and uh, we get a bounce. So um, back to the issue of exit strategy. This is a very difficult issue. Uh, now, what we're personally looking at and uh, what we've been looking at for some time is Thailand, specifically uh, the areas of Chiang Mai, which uh, if you go and do the, it's in northern Thailand, and if you do videos on YouTube, uh, specifically one of the channels we like here, I think I've shown you before, is Retire Cheap JC. He's a guy that's been living in Thailand for, I think, 25 years at least. All the tips and tricks. Uh, there's some neat stuff. If you're over 50, I believe it is, you can get a retirement visa. It's, it's 50 something is the age. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things you have to go through to keep your visas active. But if you have one of these retirement visas, I think you have to put $50,000 in a bank account, a Thai bank, and then uh, you can get your paperwork and you don't have to go through the rigmarole of leaving the country, coming back in and doing all that stuff. But all that stuff is here in some in the free videos and you can also subscribe to his member site we click on this link become a member which we have uh, been members uh, it's about 10 bucks a month I think and uh, there's a lot of information about how to uh, uh, get over there so the ones we're looking at right now are Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai Chiang Mai is in the middle northern part of Thailand Chiang Rai is in the northeastern corner closer to the border with China and uh, Chiang Mai is much more built up. It's much more of a uh, kind of uh, internet entrepreneur hub. So there's a large number of Westerners who are living there now. It's still relatively cheap. Um, you can still get a hotel or an apartment for $100 a month uh, that is fairly nice. Um, or the houses uh, are fairly cheap. It, if you want to investigate the laws, they're fairly complex about owning property there. Again, uh, retired JC channel. He has a lot of info on that. So the question is, is what's the exit strategy? We like an exit strategy outside of the US. Now, that does not present a problem for cryptocurrencies. The only issue you have to a ask yourself about when you're talking about exit strategy in regards to cryptocurrencies is which ones you want to use for your exit. Which cryptocurrency do you think is going to be the most stable? Now, I personally think that Bitcoin is the gold of all cryptocurrencies. It may turn out that Ethereum is, but uh, I th currently think that Bitcoin is the gold of cryptocurrencies. With a very, very high price that's run up this much, I'd be a little bit reluctant to store a large amount of wealth in Bitcoin right now. But if we get a correction, especially if we get a correction anywhere into this 1500 area and it stabilizes at all, I would not have any problems with uh, using a Bitcoin wallet to get money out of the country, something that we pointed out uh, a long time ago with cryptocurrency's ability to defeat capital controls. Now that can be any cryptocurrency because obviously you can take any wallet anywhere, you can upload it. You don't have to take the wallet with you. You can put the wallet up on a stored drive somewhere. You can open up a mega drive and send it up there. You can have 10 different copies of it. You can have a brain wallet. You can have a paper wallet. There's absolutely uh, a ton of ways to move your cryptocurrencies from country to country. The question is which ones? So. Litecoin is a little bit overvalued, uh, I think, based on its run-up, 5 to 30. Um, so I would be personally be looking at a correction in Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is the one that I would use. So now the question is, uh, as far as the currency, the Thai bot, this is the currency in Thailand. This is the one we're looking at. For It's been fairly stable for 
a significant number of years, you can see that since the financial crisis, pretty much the Thai bot has been 30. Uh, it's gone. You can see it's gone below down to 28. And it's risen, uh, or, or I mean, that means it's uh, getting stronger. It's weakened to 36, but pretty much the range is is 30. So um, you get you get used to doing the conversions in your head. You just uh, keep that number 30 in mind, or 33, even one third is even better because it's right there at 33. So if they quote you 1,000 baht, um, then you just immediately know that that's like 30 bucks. And you, you get used to doing those conversions. Uh, so it, it, becomes, it becomes easier. You know, if they tell you, well, it's, uh, it's one baht for this you know, bowl of chicken. Okay, well, that's 30 cents. Um, so you just get used to that uh, but that's fairly encouraging you can see that it's actually strengthening against the dollar here since uh, late 2015 it's gained roughly 20 percent from 36 to 33 no I'm sorry 10 percent the Thai bot has gained 10 percent from late 2015 to now against the US dollar which has been a very very strong currency um, so now that that's kind of the issue of cryptocurrencies and bank accounts. So our intent is to find a Thai bank. There, I believe there's a Thai bank in New York City. I researched at one point. You'll have to research it yourself. There is a branch of the Thai bank in New York City, um, and you can open up that fifty thousand dollar account if you wanted to. And I think that qualifies as a Thai bank for that retirement then if you went and filed for that retirement visa in thailand you'd uh, give them the paperwork on that thai bank and uh, that would qualify there's other ways to qualify as well you just have to show some type of income if you're on social security or if you have a pension or if you have a job uh, most like i said many of the people that are in chiang mai are inter internet entrepreneurs and uh, they have a revenue stream that comes from the internet so it really doesn't matter where they live in the world so the cheapest and freest place to be is where they want to be uh, now that that's the issue of dollars and the issue of cryptocurrencies but the biggest issue is going to be precious metals and this is going to be a big issue for us what do we do with our precious metals so ideally what we would like to do is probably vault our metals overseas um, and that creates a big risk because that means that somebody else is holding your precious metals. The only other alternative would be to leave the precious metals here in America with a relative or perhaps bury them like a pirate uh, at an undisclosed location, perhaps with a one-way GPS and leave them buried maybe. How are you going to get them out of the country? I don't know. Uh, but there are vaulting services, but this is a very disturbing article that Simon Black posted back in 2013 about Viamat uh, because they're a key company when it comes to foreign vaulting services. I'll read this so you can see uh, what kind of risks we're talking about here with foreign storage. Viamat, a Swiss logistics company that has been safeguarding precious metals since 1945, is literally the gold standard in secure storage. They have vaults from Switzerland to Hong Kong to Dubai, and they count among their clients some of the largest mining companies in the world. They know what they're doing, and now they're dumping U.S. citizens. Viamat does a great deal of business within the United States. As such, the company is heavily exposed to the insane U.S. regulatory environment. As an example, the 2010 Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, and that's uh, FATCA, turned into more than 500 pages of regulations. The costs and risks associated with compliance simply became too much for Viamat to bear. This matter-of-fact letter from Viamat Management explains their decision, quote, we are currently experiencing rapid and substantial changes in the general regulations within this business. The changes mainly relate to the tax structures and taxation systems of various countries. As a consequence of these changes, Viamat International has taken the decision to stop offering this service at its vault outside the U.S. to private customers with potential U.S. tax liability. 
This is huge. I can't possibly overstate the potential ramifications. For one, the big gold depositories like Gold Money and Bullion Vault all use Viamat as a primary secure storage provider. So it's only a matter of time before Viamat's decision cascades across these other firms. I have written extensively about this to subscribers of our premium service, Sovereign Man Confidential. Most gold storage firms are all essentially different varieties of the same exact product. They're retail marketing channels that ultimately use Viamat to store their gold bars. If Viamat has U.S. exposure, they have U.S. exposure. It's the same risk. Now, if you're in the United States in particular, one of the most important and cost-effective steps you can take in international diversification is to store precious metals overseas. Gold remains the most effective anti-currency out there, a bet against a corrupt financial system and debt-laden sovereign governments. But remember, governments have an unblemished track record of plundering their citizens' wealth. So if you store your gold in the U.S., you might as well ask Barack Obama to keep it under his mattress. If history is any guide, storing gold abroad is critical. It's one of those things that you won't be worse off for doing. The thing is, it's equally critical to work with a service provider that the U.S. that has no U.S. exposure. There are very few options out there. Again, most of the big boys use Viamat, which has heavy U.S. exposure, or Brinks, which is a U.S. company. For nearly a year, I've been encouraging our premium subscribers to store their gold with a Singapore-based company. It goes and plugs that company. So I don't know about this. This is something I'm investigating. I know some of you live abroad, and some of you use these services. So uh, anything that you have suggestion-wise in the comments would be helpful. Uh, it's it's a very painful decision for me. I certainly do not want to sell precious metals, especially the uh, precious metals that we've accumulated in the uh, semi numi area, simply because at the current suppressed prices, although we could get premiums for a lot of our coins, uh, I think we can probably get 50 bucks a coin for, for our tigers and some of the others. I, I'm... I really don't want to sell, uh, but uh, this exit strategy issue presents a problem with that because um, what choice do we have if we can't get them out of the country or store them outside of the country? And uh, that brings up the issue of cryptocurrency. Now, you can convert them to cryptocurrency. You can move gold from country to country using cryptocurrencies. Uh, um, or any precious metal, but obviously not semi-numismatics, and silver probably is too bulky, but gold, clearly you can do that. If you have, let's say you had 100 ounces of physical gold, uh, you could go to wherever you're going to sell it. You might take your some losses on the transaction. You would sell it, get your dollars, buy Bitcoin, go to the foreign country, take your Bitcoin, buy their currency, buy the gold and you've effectively transferred the gold from one country to another now there's going to be a lot of transaction costs involved there i would much rather have my precious metals just stored outside of the country probably in three different locations with three different companies just to try to minimize that risk but again i don't know enough about it uh, those of you who do i appreciate all your suggestions Again, this is this is an exit strategy that we're investigating. We definitely want to get out of the U.S. Another thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, you can renounce your U.S. citizenship and you can uh, escape all tax liability and obligation if you renounce your citizenship. But um, if you do renounce your citizenship, you also relinquish your right to your Social Security, which for me is substantial because I've worked my entire life and uh, it's a substantial, I think my social security check is roughly about $2,700 a month uh, when I retire. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you do live outside of the United States, uh, you are not taxable on the first $90,000 of your income. And I can tell you from the investigating that I've done, if you're living in Northern Thailand and you can't live on less than $90,000 a year, you've got a serious problem because stuff is really, really cheap over there. Uh, I just watched a video today on outlet malls. Uh, there's outlet malls now that are south of uh, Chiang Mai that have everything our outlet malls have at a fraction of the price. Uh, follow one guy on YouTube and 
when he flies in, he doesn't even bring clothes with him. He just goes and buys new clothes when he gets there. Some of them are as cheap as two dollars a shirt, two dollars a shirt, and five dollars for pants. So he doesn't even bother with bringing bringing in clothes. He just buys them when he gets there. That's the kind of crazy pricing differential that we have. Also, uh, I've done a lot of investigating into the Thai medical situation, and it is vastly superior to ours. There's a hu huge medical tourism industry. Uh, they have top-notch doctors, very, very low prices. That's something else that you can investigate on the JC channel. So this is what we're looking at. We're trying to put together an exit strategy, uh, combining cash, cryptos, and uh, precious metals. It's not an easy thing. Appreciate all the suggestions that you have, and we'll talk to you next time.